Right, let's have a word of prayer before we uh, come and look at Hebrews 7. Father, we ask that as we consider your word together this morning, that uh, you will help every one of us, Lord, that we might have a fresh understanding of what the writer is trying to say, and that we might be encouraged by the things that we see together. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read the whole of the chapter. We shall be just looking at verses 4 to 28. I'm going to take all of that because so much of the passage is really uh, an argument that is developing. And we don't need to spend too much time on looking the introduction to the, those arguments. It's probably the conclusion that we need to pay most attention to. So uh, I'm going to read the whole of Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God, uh, most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spores, was first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, But made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who receive the priest office have commandment in the Lord to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in the case of the one who receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives on, and so to speak through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the Lord made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath threw the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. 
for the law appoints men as high priests to our weak. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. It's really those last three verses that are the, the main point, the conclusion of it all. Uh, but we begin with certain things that we do need to consider. And uh, we're very much looking at a superior priesthood this morning. A superior priesthood. The fact is that uh, you remember right the way through the book of Hebrews that the writer is pointing out that that new covenant that we have in Jesus, the whole work that Jesus has done is superior to anything that has gone before. Remember in the first chapter he said that God has spoken in many ways in the past, but in these last days he has spoken by his Son. And nobody is greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Even when angels had brought something of a message, Jesus was far superior to them. At no time had God said, this is your throne to the angels, as he said to the Son. So we trace that through right at the beginning, and really right the way through, he is attempting to show that what has happened in Jesus is far greater than anything that has gone before. Here we'll see that uh, actually he's pointing out that Jesus is greater even than Abraham. And for the Jews, he was the father of their nation. He was the, the father of their religion. So much had begun by Abraham. They even looked back to him to see that he was a man who walked by faith. And God counted that as righteousness. Even a picture for us today. That we cannot earn our own salvation. It is simply faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. And what he's done for us at Calvary. And you may remember that we've seen that it appears from this letter. That some of these Jewish believers were beginning to turn away. They weren't holding on fast. They were drifting from their faith. And the challenge is how shall they escape if they neglect so great a salvation? Because everything has come to its conclusion in Christ. And now we're looking at the fact that here is Jesus. And God has said that he will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we saw something of this, uh, this king last time. Just to recap, uh, that in Genesis 14 we, we saw Melchizedek. It's the only place he's mentioned. There are certain things that we discovered that he, his name means king of righteousness. Melech is king, Zedek is righteousness. So he's the king of righteousness. Reminder that he's not only perfect, he's righteous absolutely, but through him and by faith in him we find righteousness with God. Then he was king of Salem, which means king of peace. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that we're right with God because we've accepted what Jesus did for us upon the cross. He was priest of God most high, was Melchizedek. That's how he's ex uh, explained. But the highest God in the universe, because remember so many considered there were many gods at that time, the most high God, he was priest of that God. Of uh, Jehovah or Yahweh, whatever uh, the Hebrew uh, name is that we're not sure of. And they so reverenced him, they would not even use the name of God loosely. They still don't. If they write the word God, the Jews, they write G, uh, and they put a line under where the O should go, and then D. Because they're even careful about using God in a wrong way. And perhaps we need to show a little bit more concern of how we use uh, expletives. And uh, we shouldn't use the name of God in any loose way. But uh, there he was. He was the priest of God most high. In the scripture, there's no mention of his uh, birth or of his death. And that's quite surprising because genealogy is very important in the Bible. Uh, just to trace through one's ancestry. Because so often... It was through that ancestry that God was at work. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for instance. That God was working through those three generations. But there's nothing here. It almost seems that he has always been and he always will. 
And that's what the writer is taking up here because that's exactly how it is with Jesus. He always has been. Right before creation, he may have taken a human form when he came to Bethlehem, but he now goes on living forever because of his resurrection. So uh, this is particularly what the writer is taking up about Jesus, that he's always been there and always will be. As we saw, uh, Melchizedek met with Abraham, or Abram as he was then, and Abram had just rescued Lot. And uh, the priest comes out to meet him, Melchizedek comes to meet him, this kingly priest, and he meets him with bread and wine. And again, uh, not saying that was anything more than just uh, food and drink, but it is quite interesting, because uh, Jesus inaugurated that new covenant as he had that uh, bread and wine of the Passover meal and they spoke so powerfully of his death of the shedding of his blood of the giving of his life for us so he meets us in a sense in the same way as Melchizedek and then Abraham gave a, a tenth uh, a, a tithe of the spoils of war and uh, we take that up in a little moment uh, uh, as to how the writer to the Hebrews sees that. So let's just go on developing the argument as it's set out here. As I've already said, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is seen really as superior to Abraham. Abraham is giving him a tithe, just as a tithe was brought to the priest as part of a worship to God. But then he takes an argument that we wouldn't all altogether see as, uh, uh, as being a logical argument, really. Remember that I said about uh, the Jewish argument, uh, um, Midrash, as they call it. It's looking for something of the hidden meaning behind things, beyond just what is written there very clearly. And the writer is using something of that uh, Jewish argument, that Hebrew argument. And he says... Abraham eventually gave birth to uh, Levi, who became the priestly tribe. And Aaron, of course, was the, the beginning of that, uh, uh, or the, the son of uh, Levi. And he became the first high priest. And tithes were given to them. And what he's arguing is, in a sense, in Abraham's body was the generations to come. So Abraham, uh, so Melchizedek received a tithe not only from Abraham, but in effect from the Levitical priests that were to follow. As I say, that probably doesn't altogether fit in with our thinking, uh, but that's what he's saying. So he's saying this, this Melchizedek is even superior to the, the Levitical priests, because he has received gifts from them. He's superior. It's it's him that they're giving uh, their tribute to. And then it goes on uh, to say that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And again, the argument here is that the greater will bless the lesser. You receive blessing from somebody who is greater than yourself. So here again, Melchizedek is seen as greater than even Father Abraham to whom they gave so much allegiance, and sometimes almost wrongly so. So we're seeing this argument built up that Melchizedek is bigger than anything that went on in the priesthood to follow. We talk about the Levitical priesthood, meaning those priests that were of the tribe of Levi. And the high priest was particularly of that tribe. He was the firstborn that went all the way through from Abraham uh, from Aaron, rather, uh, in that uh, priest, in that uh, tribe. And then it says the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. It says for a start, they weren't perfect, and they could bring back nothing perfect. They couldn't perfect you. In one sense, even the sacrifices they brought, as we saw last Sunday evening, the sacrifices they brought were a temporary measure, a covering for sin, until it was dealt with completely in Jesus, when he paid the ultimate sacrifice. So here is a priesthood that was temporary, that wasn't perfect, 
waiting really for that complete priesthood in Jesus. Talks about a new priesthood arising of the order of Melchizedek. And this particularly comes from Psalm 110. We looked at it last time, just that uh, verse, uh, or those four, first four verses. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And very clearly, the Jews of Jesus' time knew that this was referring to the Messiah. The God, the Lord, said to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's Yahweh saying to Adonai, so there is a difference in the Hebrew. It's plainly saying that Yahweh, God Almighty, said to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I put all enemies under your feet. And we believe that is happening. That Jesus is now at the right hand of God. And the time will come when every opponent of the Lord Jesus Christ will be dealt with, including Satan himself. And that's, of course, how the Bible ends. But it goes on that psalm, which they recognize very clearly was speaking of the Messiah to come, that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So God, is, when he uh, inspires David to write that psalm, shows that there would be a different sort of priesthood, which was not like the priest of Levi, that Levitical tribe, but would be something different, and that it would be something eternal, that uh, because... We don't see of his birth or his death. There would be something that was quite different. And he would be a king. Because Melchizedek means uh, king of righteousness. And of course the psalm begins by seeing him reigning at God's right hand. And of course in the Old Testament you had never seen a king who was priest. A couple tried it on. And one of the priests, uh, one of the kings actually ended up with leprosy because he was usurping power that God had never given him. But no priest had ever become king either. So this is absolutely unique that God is promising. That one who would reign would also be priest. And of course we believe all of that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Goes on to say, our Lord was from the tribe of Judah. Not from the tribe of Levi. This is the kingly tribe. This is David's tribe. And here is one who is going to come, who is going to be a different sort of priest. It's perhaps quite interesting that he says our Lord there. He's talked about Jesus as being the Son of God. He's used all sorts of terms. Clearly he says our Lord here. Perhaps he's thinking of that psalm that says the Lord said to our Lord, or to my Lord as David puts it. But he's from a different tribe. God is showing that he's bringing in something different. Because the first covenant was not perfect. And again that will be made clearer as we go through uh, Hebrews at a later stage. And he's saying this priesthood is based on an indestructible life. Quite powerful words isn't it? Here is somebody who cannot be destroyed. He may have taken a human form and, uh, and died physically for us and for our salvation. But he was raised from the dead to show that he goes on living. And he carries on his work as priest even now. So we've got a priesthood that goes on forever. One that we can absolutely rely on. All the other priests lived and died. And as it says here. They had to have a succession of them because they, their time all came to an end. But Jesus never will. So again we're seeing that there's a far greater priesthood than anything that they were looking back to. Perhaps thinking, oh it was great what we had before. He's saying no, this is far greater. And it goes on to say that uh, we have a better hope by which we are able to draw near to God. That hope is all based on what Jesus has done. And uh, we shall go on to see a little later that now we can come freely into the presence of God. Uh, only on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies, which signified the presence of God, just once a year. And then he had to bring a sacrifice for his own sin. 
we will go on to see in later weeks that we can come freely to God. It's as if that veil that uh, divided the holy and holy, holy of holies off from the rest of the temple has been torn in two, which it literally was when Jesus died. God is saying now the way is open. And you may remember when we finished uh, chapter 6, it talks about Jesus has entered for us, having gone through the veil, right into the presence of God, who is a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He also says, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Jesus has gone right into the Holy of Holies in heaven so that we may have an absolute certainty that we can have salvation through him. In a sense, you didn't have that in the Old Covenant. You brought your sacrifices, you went through the Day of Atonement, uh, but it was really just a covering until the thing was complete in Christ. And what is more, this was established by God's oath. God has said, as we see there in uh, verse 21, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord will not change his mind. Remember again in Hebrews 6, we saw that the Lord made promises to Abraham and he swore by himself because you couldn't swear by anyone greater. And it goes on to say there were two unchangeable things. God's word that could not change. The oath remained absolutely unbreakable. And God who did not change. The greatness of God. The promise to Abraham was therefore sure. We have that same idea here. God has sworn. He does not change his mind. He knows what is necessary. And Jesus is a priest forever. And I've put there in brackets Psalm 110 and verse 4 because that's what's being quoted uh, there. You may like to look sometime at Psalm 110. And so he ends in verse 22 that uh, we have a, a, a better covenant. He says, uh, so much uh, the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. If this priesthood is forever, then this this assurance of salvation is forever for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who put their trust in him. So that's the developing argument here. And I've uh, summarized it just to make it easy, because some of it isn't uh, easy to pick up as we read it through. But I hope you can see something of what he's saying. He's saying, really, everything is so much better in Jesus why would you hearken back all the time to the things as they were, to the old covenant, to the priesthood and the sacrifices, when Jesus has fulfilled all that? In fact, uh, I can't quite remember where it was now. Uh, yes, I think we were seeing last Sunday night in, uh, uh, in Hebrews 10, where it says, uh, these things are only a shadow of the reality to come. Uh, shadow, uh, you see perhaps somebody passing along the road, you see the shadow coming, but then you see the person. One is a vague outline. The person, when they come, is a reality. In the Old Covenant, we ha see an outline of something that was to come. The shape is there, but the actual completion, the fulfillment, the reality, the, 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 the clearness, the clarity is all seen in Jesus. So if we look at the Old Covenant, we can thank God that God made some provision for the Jewish people. But it was only a picture of what is to follow in Jesus. And in Jesus, it's so much greater. I hope you've uh, followed at least something of those arguments. It's not altogether easy to follow in one sense. And uh, uh, this book has, brings many challenges, but equally sometimes uh, because of our Lack of familiarity with Jewish things, we don't cotton on quite so quickly. But we come to the matter of a, the perfect priest. And the first thing he says in, in verse uh, 23 and uh, 24 is the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, 
holds his priesthood permanently. You know, one of the things the, the high priest uh, had to do, as I've said before, he had on his shoulder the six, uh, on one shoulder, six uh, of the tribes, uh, their names uh, engraved, and on the other shoulder, the other six. So that, as it were, he was bearing them up before God. And his job was very much to pray for the nation. Pray that God would help them, inspire them. Times when he would uh, make sacrifices for their sin and so on, particularly on the Day of Atonement. Uh, and to have somebody who actually prays on our behalf, who intercedes on our behalf, to know that he's always there. You know, earlier on he said that, um, again, if I can find the, the right chapter, it's the end of chapter 3, I think. Um, yes, uh, therefore he had to be made like his brethren. He took a human form like us uh, to be the high priest, as it were. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered. He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And then it goes on in the end of chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it's showing that this high priest Jesus is there permanently. He's always there, day and night. Doesn't matter what our problems might be. He'll be there, in a, if the world lasts another thousand years, and I don't think it will for one moment, he'll still be there as our high priest. He has a permanent priesthood. We can keep on coming back to him and ask for help in all that we face. You might get very used to one priest uh, who was officiating in the temple. But one day you would hear of his death. You couldn't go to him any longer. But we can always go to Jesus. That's the point that he's making here. It's an eternal priesthood. Goes on to say that he is able to save forever or completely. Verse 25, therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is able to save forever. There perhaps comes a day when we recognize that we are sinners. We don't like to hear that. We don't like to be told we're not perfect, that we've sinned. Uh, but the fact is we all have. And we need a savior. Jesus is that savior. And part of what he did was to offer his life as a sacrifice for sin. But what is more then, he has gone before the Father and said, in effect, I have suffered in their place. Now they are accepting what I did for them on the cross. Lord, will you save them and break into their lives? Jesus is not only a priest, but he's a savior. One who can save utterly and completely. And the moment you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and put your life in his hands and ask him to change you, he breaks through into your life to save you and to make you a different person. He's a, a savior, a priest who is able to save completely. There's no doubt about it. And my friends, if you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and sometimes you may doubt whether you're a Christian or not, Know for sure that he has saved you completely and will go on saving you completely all the time you put your, hand, your, your life in his hands. All the time you continue in faith. Remember there are some uh, quotes here that remind them that they need to go on. Uh, Plies perhaps they can lose their salvation but the fault is not with Christ. He is able to hold you and keep you completely forever. Such as his power, and particularly his power over the enemy, over Satan. No priest could really help out like that. You know, it's one of the reasons why we particularly don't believe in a priesthood, except it does talk about the priesthood of all believers, because we can all come directly to God. You don't need to go to God through me or any other priest. You go simply through the Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. Jesus died for you. God has, as it were, made him a priest by which you could approach God. 
Remember Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except by me. We don't need the saints. We don't need Mary. Mary was a wonderful uh, mother, a wonderful uh, woman, a righteous woman, one to be honored. But we do not go to God through Mary. We have direct access to God himself through Jesus and what he has done. And in the case of we pray to Jesus, Jesus is God. But basically we come to the Father through Jesus from what he has done. But he is acting on our behalf right now. Because it goes on to say he always lives to make intercession for us. Now the priest died. When they kicked the bucket, you couldn't ask them to pray for you. But we can always go to Jesus and know that he's pleading on our behalf, particularly that, as it were, that his blood will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we do sin, because he made that perfect sacrifice for us. Something more we have to say about Jesus, that uh, he is holy and exalted, as he puts it here in verse 26, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. In other words, it's saying that Jesus is absolutely perfect, and now he's gone into heaven itself. The best the high priest could do would to be going to the Holy of Holies that represented something of God's presence. But Jesus has gone right into the heavens. In fact, having been raised from the dead and gone into heaven, he shows us what will happen to us when we die. That we will go into the presence of God. But here is, again, we see very clearly a far more superior priest, a perfect priest. Which is another point uh, that he makes, and he will make it again when he talks about the Day of Atonement later in the book. He does not need to offer up a sacrifice for his sins. All the other priests had to. Before they could even offer up a sacrifice for somebody else, particularly on the Day of Atonement, they had to offer a sacrifice for their own sin. Jesus is perfect. He needn't have died because the wages of sin is death. But he died because he was paying the penalty for your sin and mine. And he knew that separation from God because that's the penalty of sin. That we are separated from God for some eternally. What the Bible calls hell. If they don't receive what Jesus has done because sin cuts us off from God. <laughs> Jesus knew something of that as he died upon that cross. When he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he paid supremely the sacrifice for your sin and mine. He didn't suffer for his own sins. He didn't have to offer up a sacrifice for his sins. It was a complete and finished work. And as it says here, he offered himself once for all. Once in time and for everybody. He will go on to talk about the Day of Atonement. When year by year they brought those sacrifices on the day for covering their sin, which is what the Day of Atonement means. And we'll go into that in greater detail. But it's saying, Jesus didn't have to do it year after year. He did it just once at Calvary when he died for you. He's done it for all time and for all people. No exception. But he invites you to receive what he's done. He invites you to follow him. He invites you to trust him. He invites you to receive him as saviour. But he's done it for everyone. Again, okay, another reason why we don't have an altar in our church. The Reformation really didn't go far enough. The Anglicans have still got an altar. We don't have an altar. We have a, a table of remembrance. Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. There was only one altar, as it were, and that was at Calvary. When he sacrificed himself. Did it once and for all. And that will be repeated several times here. Again, in contrast to what they do and still do in Israel today, have that year of atonement, a day of atonement, which they've just had. We were in Israel on one occasion when they went through it. Uh, uh, the, there's no traffic. Um, nobody goes to work. They do go to synagogue. But it's absolutely quiet. It's a, 
a sense in which they recognize something of their sin. But they used to have a sacrifice for their sin, a blood sacrifice for their sin when they had the temple. They haven't got the temple any longer. As if God is saying, you don't need a temple anymore. You don't need these sacrifices anymore. Jesus has done it once for all time. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. You can have an absolute assurance this morning that your sin is forgiven <coughs> if you've received Jesus as Savior and Lord. Because it's a complete work. Nothing can be added to it. it goes on to say, He is the Son made perfect forever. For the law appoints men as high priests to a weak best of us are weak we sin but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever there it is he's reached the climax of it here is the son of God who is a high priest and he's there forever why were they looking back to their priesthood and to other things he is king and priest he is establishing the rule of God, the kingdom of God in the lives of people. So that they're saying today, in effect, we will have you to be king over us. Whereas the Jews rejected Jesus and said, we don't want him to be king over us, or at least some of them did. But he's not only the king who brings in the kingdom and the rule of God on earth when he returns. He is that priest who is made perfect. Strange phrase. As if he wasn't perfect at one time. But you know, I don't think you're ever perfect really until you've been tested. Excuse me, using the uh, picture I've used several times. I thought I did pretty well when I lived on my own. And uh, uh, I had no children. I, uh, you know, eventually got married and then the problem started. You know, the children came along and you blew your stack with them sometimes. And you suddenly realized you weren't so perfect. Uh, that perhaps you did have a temper after all occasionally. When you were provoked. It's only when you are really tested. That you know what you're made of. And it was with Jesus. When he was tempted there in the wilderness. And throughout his life in many ways. He never succumbed one moment. He never did a single thing wrong. So as it were. And that word perfect in, in Hebrew. Uh, in Greek means. Uh, the end of a process as well. And in a sense, the end of the process of Jesus living that perfect life, dying for your sin and mine, and then being raised from the dead, he's been there made a perfect priesthood, and it's forever. My friends, why would we try to find salvation in any other way? In deeds, or good deeds, or building a reputation for ourselves, or even through re religious ritual. God has provided the one thing by that oath, he says that Jesus is that priest. After the order of Melchizedek, he will always be there for you. And my dear friends, if you haven't called upon Jesus uh, as Savior and Lord, I can tell you this, that even if on your deathbed you have not turned to the Lord and asked him to save you, even then he's there for you. But please don't leave it till then. How much better to know that glorious hope now to have that certainty now that you're right with God because of what Jesus has done. And to know that in heaven you have your representative. One who took our form, that is our representative as it were, but bore the penalty for our sin. And still pleads for us in heaven. For our forgiveness and for our salvation. You know, it's little wonder really that Jesus, when he broke bread on that last night, what we call the last supper, said, do this in remembrance of me. Because he's bringing in the new covenant. And again, we'll look at that in more detail as we go through Hebrews. Something has changed. The priesthood has changed. The means of salvation has changed. There's a, a better hope, better blood, better covenant. It keeps on stressing these things all the way through this book. Yes, God worked marvellously. And I would say to some people who put so much store on Jewish things because they sometimes seem to get taken up with Israel and that, why get taken up with that so much? Yes, God's got purposes for Israel when everything has been completed in Jesus. 
He's done his final work for us in Christ. And this morning, you can come to Christ and ask him to save you if you've never done so before. But equally, you can come with that assurance that these symbols of Jesus' death, of his life given up for you, is absolutely the way of salvation for you and the assurance of, of righteousness before God by faith, of peace with God by faith. So Jesus is all of that for everyone.